This session is one on process automation. This is an example of process automation with which I'm deeply uncomfortable, of course. I see some threat to me there. Um, process automation, the use of software or robotics software to carry out standardized routine processes like pulling the data out of um, yeah, invoices and using it to populate the relevant fields in a financial management system. I'm sure these people will be able to explain why I've got that completely wrong, because they, yeah, they know far more than I. Okay, so first we have Rania uh, Leontaridi, who's a director for AI and Business Growth at the Department for Business, Energy and in uh, Industry, UK. Uh, Dmitry Yegorov, um, Deputy Secretary General for Tax and Customs Policy of the Ministry of Finance in Estonia. Marcel von Wendland is consultant for Finworks, the uh, knowledge partner for this session. Uh, we have from Singapore, Paul Loke, who's Director uh, of Technology and Chief uh, Information Officer in the Accountant General's Department of the Treasury in Singapore and has done some incredible things. And um, in a slight change, we have James Merrick Potter, Head of Robotic Automation for Cabinet's Office. Um, this is a, a fantastic panel for the subject. And I think we'll, if we do it again, so again, we'll do five minutes from each um, and then go to the floor. So, right here. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Um, uh, I am uh, wearing normally my Director for Artificial Intelligence hat in, in the UK, but today I'm not going to wear that hat. I'm just going to go back to my roots, being uh, studied life as economist, data scientist. So I'm going to wear some of that and talk to you some of the exciting and world-leading things that we do with automation and with our data. Um, you all know, and Kevin stole some of my thunder on the work that we're doing on AI and on automation. My own department, the Department for Business, for example, is looking at exciting progress, work, projects, working very closely with Jamie and the Cabinet Office on things like how do we create energy and household data, pulling it together to ensure that customers, for example, can see where they save money in real time. Or how do we automate things like our HR processes? So we have a new HR performance system creating just mere uh, chatbots that they can answer questions quickly and alleviate some of the pressure in large departments like ours of 3,000 people. Um, and also, how do we create something which is closer to, to our heart at, at this time, real-life business dashboards on seeing how the economy is doing in real life? And these are all in the making, and I'm sure that uh, we'll be more than happy to share more details in future events. But today, as I said, I really wanted to focus on, on something which is uh, very exciting. I've talked to many colleagues around the world, and we are pioneers in, in that respect. And if you think about how this all fits together, automation, robotics process automation, is always a precursor to truly AI-run services. So we're starting from something modest, and we are hoping to expand, is how we use UK tax data to predict business activity. So let me tell you a little bit about and why we're doing that. Um, we know that when we have business data in our hands, quite a lot of time we use it to either uh, understand businesses that we have, tax them of course, but also do research and monitor and evaluation. And these are the three boxes in the bottom. 
but we're not really good at across the world is looking at real-time data to ensure that if we were to offer support to businesses, we don't do it on spending our pennies normally across everyone. We're not very good at knowing how to target them. So this project, it does exactly that. It focuses on real-time tax data in being able to see in life, in, in real time, how businesses change, how they grow, or how productive or unproductive they may be, and therefore in the future, enabling us to real-time uh, target them. Um, so, we chose one specific uh, example, uh, we are progressing to other pilots, but the first one is to see can we predict growth of businesses. We chose an international term called scale-ups, how businesses grow 20% year on year, and we tried to use, first of all, our data to see can we see what's happening now, can we see the ones that are actually growing 20% year on year. We identified about 13,700 uh, 13, businesses. We looked looked at a massive sample of 3.2 million UK businesses and to give you a perspective, the UK have, has 5.7 million businesses active uh, as we speak now. But the beauty is that of that particular pilot is that we pull together lots and lots of variables uh, to look through them and identify and see the ones that they are growing. Equally, and another part of the forest we're looking to see are the ones that may not be as profitable and not being as productive as they would do. Um, having looked at our real data, what is happening now, the exciting part is that we're trying to predict. We're trying to predict by using algorithms what happens in the future. How are these businesses, or how any UK business may be able to flourish, may be able to grow. And uh, what, what our graph sort of shows is, this is not, uh, uh, it's an illustrative... It's an illustrative uh, graph. Um, what it's trying to show is that we take the 20 best percent of our sample and within that we can do about 50 percent prediction, which is actually not bad at all. So where are we going next? Uh, as my time is finishing here, as I said, pretty exciting. We can't share this outside, uh, but we're hoping to be able to create data sets in the future to help uh, our policymakers to do real-time work. We're going to pilot in specific regions, so I will be able to see what your business is doing, how well is it growing, and we'll be able to target them and say, do you know what? In your region, if you have a problem of productivity, if you're not as pro profitable as possible, go to this service over there. You have been selective. We know that you have an issue, we know that you're a star and you're growing, so go and seek support. Um, we're hoping that, uh, as I said, we'll be able to use some of those pilots to do a lot more exciting things. In some cases we may need uh, legislation, uh, but what is really fascinating is that will enable us to do real-time policy making, targeting businesses in, in, in the UK and understanding uh, what they do. Thank you. Thank you, Rania. Dimitri. Right. So I'm waiting for the presentation. Right. Thank you. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, let me uh, uh, speak a little bit about the uh, process automation as it happens in our tax administration uh, for, um, as it has happened for quite so many years, and what, the, what are the plans that uh, we have for the uh, immediate future. So, um, the most important question for us in taxpayer service is uh, what is the ultimate goal of uh, taxpayer service? And I may be a little bit provocative uh, uh, when I say that uh, uh, our most important goal is uh, to avoid uh, customers uh, or taxpayers uh, coming to the office. Uh, or if they're there, uh, our goal is to push them out as soon as possible. Uh, the thing is that taxes are usually described as dead weight for those who are familiar with economy. Uh, economics, uh, of course, uh, uh, know this, but uh, of course, uh, cumbersome tax administration adds even more burden to that uh, uh, dead weight. So this is why, uh, for us, uh, it is important that we save uh, taxpayers time and we save them money uh, so that they do their business, not our business. So, um, here are some of the examples uh, how we do this um, in Estonia. Personal income tax reporting, let me tell you this. Um, electronic reporting is available from fe February 15 until March 31st every year. Um, this year, 
during the first day, during the first 24 hours of operations, we received half of all tax returns. Half of all tax returns uh, that uh, we were supposed to be receiving. It's not that Estonian people really love to pay their taxes, uh, but it, it's the fact that that tax return actually gives you the right to claim your tax refund, and so so it's it's the other way around. So we offer five-day refunds for non-problematic uh, e-filing, and e-filing right now stands at 96 percent. So only four percent of people do their taxes on paper. It usually takes about three to four minutes to file your taxes because uh, there's uh, basically no manual input because, uh, you know, we, we get all the, the data from, from uh, uh, employers and banks and, and, and uh, universities, uh, so forth. And we run automated risk analysis. So um, uh, most of the tax returns are not even looked at uh, by the uh, tax administration. And, and if we find a mistake, then we ask the taxpayer to, to contact, for example, the employer or the bank and, and correct the mistake themselves. VAT refunds is another thing that uh, is very uh, important fat for taxpayers because it's their money that sits in the hands of the government and we need to give it back as soon as possible. So VAT returns actually come electronically, come in electronically at nearly 100%. Uh, we also have uh, uh, sellers' uh, uh, reports and buyers' reports uh, coming in separately so that uh, uh, we can uh, cross-check the data. Um, and um, uh, we then apply a significant number of uh, risk criteria, again, to uh, make sure that uh, those uh, green returns in, in, in the language of customs corridors um, get a refund uh, as soon as possible. About um, two to three days is a normal time. So uh, due to the cross-referencing and, and using a lot of uh, risk criteria, we have been able to uh, reduce the VAT gap in less than uh, two years from 14 to 5 percent. That to say is that we've got millions uh, of euros coming in without raising the tax rate or um, increasing the, the tax base, widening the tax base. I think in the future we don't need a tax man at all. Uh, perhaps not even for tax services because banks can overtake this uh, uh, pretty easily. So what we do with one of the um, particularly innovative banks uh, in Estonia is that if a uh, cashless business, and we have lots of those, you know, uh, a man and a laptop type of business, um, if they pay only salary and dividends, then there is no need for a tax return because if they make these payments, salary payments through the bank, they just let the bank know it's a, it's a salary. The bank sends the information to tax administration. The reply comes back from the tax administration saying this is the amount of taxes that are associated with this salary and the bank debits that automatically. So there's more time to do business. And I think in future, a tax return is not needed at all, because what is a tax return? Tax return is just the same data that the taxpayer already has in their computer, just in another format. So when you submit that to the tax administration, what the tax administration does is, you know, reformat it back into the data. Why do we do that? You know, let's just... Uh, plug the cord in for those taxpayers who don't have anything to hide and uh, they're using the, the software from companies that cooperate with tax administration and uh, this data can come in to the uh, tax administration and uh, the taxes can be done. The same actually is true for, for statistical reports. Not all of them, but uh, and not, not as of now, but uh, in future that's uh, probably going to be uh, reality for us. So those are some of the uh, examples of what we do in Estonia, and I'd be happy to take questions and share more of our experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marcel. Welcome to process automation and uh, the crucial role it plays as a platform for innovators. Now, digital has been around us uh, for a little while, and it's already had tremendous impact on our daily lives. It's completely transformed what life is, what work is. But there is so much more ahead, so much more potential for process automation and, and, and data to infuse and augment and help us. So my question is, 
are you ready to take advantage, to take this forward, this great transformation, to make the most of it? Well, in that context, let me take you back in time on a little journey. Um, does anybody here remember what they did on Friday, the 12th of September, 2008? Well, let me give you a bit of a memory jog here. This was the Friday before the Monday on which Lehman Bank failed, the start of the financial crisis. And I know what the head of the European uh, Central Bank, Jean-Claude Trichet, did that morning. He woke up, first thing he did is tell the data team, give me an accurate picture of what Lehman is, the thousands of entities that make up Lehman, what instruments they issued, and how they fit into the wider financial system. Well, he did that at seven, and by eight he had a picture that later on turned out to be really absolutely accurate. It was you know, a few, few missing data points, but nothing uh, that mattered. And at eight o'clock New York time, the Federal Reserve had no such picture. They didn't have it for days, and most banks didn't have this for weeks. And that picture really mattered. It really helped the European Central Bank, the National Central Banks in Europe, and central banks like the Federal Reserve around the planet to actually plan accurately how to deal with this event. It helped uh, heads of government to shape policy and create a response that, that helped us avert that crisis becoming even worse. So the innovation matters, but the ECB didn't have that picture by accident. In 2004, they started on a process automation and innovation program with us, Finworks, uh, to transform their way they look at a process, their data about uh, financial instruments and uh, the entities that, that issue them. And it was that program that actually enabled uh, them to have that picture then. And it connected all the different pieces together that were necessary to get that, the full picture. So innovation is connectedness. And process automation is the, one of the key technologies to bring those different pieces together to create that connectedness. But connect connectedness, the technology is only part of the picture. The other part of innovation is people. And that was a crucial part in the ECB, and it's been a crucial part in my professional experience um, all the way through my career. Bringing the people to, uh, to, to the technology, allowing the connection between the technology and the innovators to let them engage with the capabilities that it, 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 it has. That's really what sets free the power of transformation. So uh, the challenge in this, oh, <laughs> the challenge in this is that we, we see often see uh, process automation as rocket science. That's the real sort of uh, holdback for people. Now underneath it, yes, process automation is complex, but cars are complex. And if we looked at the underneath, under the hood. Uh, complexity in cars, we would never drive one. Many of us anyway wouldn't. Um, so we need to make sense. We need to see uh, process automation as the capabilities it gives us so we can connect the data that powers the transformation, the intelligence that gives us the insights, the case management that allows us to transform uh, citizens' experiences in, into individualized experiences that are really efficient and really helpful for, for everyone concerned. To deliver empowered automation that not just displaces, but also uh, augments people's capabilities, often infused with AI. And rapid application delivery, a rapid uh, evolution of the capabilities that are being uh, delivered by the service that you're transforming. That is a platform for innovators. And the future here starts today. 
That's the journey on which you can discover extraordinary. And I encourage you all to come to our stand, stand 14, after, after the session or throughout the day to have, have a bit more of a chat. Thank you. Oh. Very good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm out of the Accounting Generals. We are the government financials and payroll. So we operate that out of Singapore. I thought I'd share a little bit today about Singapore's public sector journey in process automation. This is the Singapore government's digital journey. Started way back in the 80s with basic automation. We are now looking at digitization across all the various public services that we deliver to the whole of government, to the citizen, um, to all our various stakeholders. In 2017, no, 2018, I'm sorry, um, we launched a smart nation and digital government blueprint. Now this starts to talk about the, digitally, the digital economy, a digital government, and digital society. Themes that we've all heard presented over and over and over again today, and I'm sure we're gonna hear more about it throughout the course of the day. As part of public sector transformation, we started to look at operational and technology integration. We've heard a lot about how policy needs uh, data points from the operation. So does technology. I can't push a piece of technology out there and say, here, here's a wonderful piece of technology. Guys, please take it and use it. Right? I need a business use case. And one of the, the technologies that we identified as something that was good for us um, was robotic process automation. So what we said was, well, we're going to do a, an immersion program. How do we encourage our public sector agencies to look at robotic process automation, to try it out, to play around with it, and get comfortable with the technology? Right? So this is what, how it went. We started out and tested RPA in different public sector agencies. We said we assess the benefits, and then we try and build the capability within the government. How do we make sure that we have people who can do the process review? How do we make sure we, can, we have people who can actually develop and maintain these robots? This is what we found. The wide range of archetype processes. Everybody's up there. Everything from human resources to finance and procurement, I know, Finance and procurement is one of the areas, and especially I'll talk a little bit about that in, in depth after this. Um, finance is one, of the process, is one of the areas that RPA is really well suited for, but interestingly, some of the business and operations uh, were also able to use RPA for some of their business processes. Um, I see people taking photos of slides, please feel free to do so, but I will get these to you if you want them, all right? So the AGD experience, what we experience ourselves. Accountant General's Department, like I say, we are, ministry, we are a department under the Ministry of Finance. We manage payroll, we manage cash management, we manage uh, financial uh, payments to all our vendors. Okay. Our mission and vision, I won't go too, too much into this. This is our financial analytics platform. I won't talk too much about this as well. I'm just going to make mention of it and I'll explain why in a little bit. So some of our early trials, like I say, increase awareness, try it out. First pilot was a simple cut and paste job. Anybody who's done RPA, everybody knows cut and paste? Yeah, robot does it faster, more accurately. This was the second one, payroll audits. Now, we are blessed. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, we are blessed, okay? Government payrolls are generally, the rules on uh, promotions, merit increments, and bonuses are generally very heavily codified. As part of our audit process, what we used to do was, and how many people love our auditors? Anybody here really love the auditors? Right? What do auditors do when they come? It's called random sampling. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I'll pick the sample. And we as auditees, please God, don't let them pick the, that sample. <laughs> so we said, no, we've got to do this better. Um, I come from cybersecurity. We said, let's adopt a, ven a VAPT, ven a ven Vulnerability Assessment and Penetration Testing Method of Doing Things. We'll put the entire organization's payroll through the robot. The robot has all the rules. It will flag all the exceptions, then we go and poke at the exceptions. So that gives us a lot more in-depth, it gives us a lot of wider coverage, it gives us a lot of additional insights, and we look at what really are the problems. Right? Anything that is accurate, we don't look at it. So that gives my auditors very good focus. I'm not sure the agencies we audit like us, but well, that's what we do. Number two, public utilities block billing. The first half of this is recon. Right? You get a bill, you get a usage report, somebody sits there for half a day and matches the numbers. Is that what I want the staff to do? No. So we said, let's get a robot to do that. But as part of that, we started to plug 
all that information that the robot does, and financial, financial systems generally capture things at the journal level, but if I want the granular detail, it's a lot of work to recapture it. Given that the robots are already doing that, we plug it into our analytics system. That allows us to find outliers. So if somebody's making calls at midnight when they shouldn't be, we can spot that. Or if their usage trends are abnormal, we can spot that. All right? Other opportunities, this is about 3,000 man hours of savings. Uh, reconciliation <coughs> jobs are, like I say, one of the heaviest time-consuming tasks that, financial prof uh, that finance prof professionals do. All right, um, time's up. 30 seconds more, Land Transport Authority, yeah. same thing. Applications, how fast can they process them? Speeds it up. Vital, our shared services center. A lot of process time saving, and we are now looking at unattended. And the Ministry of Home Affairs. Again, routing of uh, POs, direct invoices, including uh, business operation asset shells. All right, thank you very much, and I'll be around all day. Thank you. Yeah, do find Paul and grab him at some point. Uh, meanwhile, um, James Merrick Potter, Head of Robotic Automation, Cabinet Office. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for your time. I'll, I'll try and be brief because we've got lots to talk about. Um, so I run a small team in the Cabinet Office that's responsible for robotic process automation. It's a centre of excellence that is, uh, was established two years ago to try and encourage other departments uh, to, to take this technology up and start to test it out, basically playing on that push thing that Paul talked about, trying to persuade and encourage departments to try stuff. Um, very quickly, why is government, UK government using RPA? Um, well, simply, it's scale and potential. So we are a huge user of legacy systems across the 29 ministerial departments. We have myriad legacy systems, all are in different stages of transformation, all will be replaced at some stage, uh, but until that happens there is lots of gaps between the new and the old and lots of green screen, lots of uh, kind of spaces for process inefficiency that we think RPA can, can help solve. Um, and we think the scale's relevant. We have 400,000 civil servants, we do a huge amount of things, we do lots and lots of processes, um, massive millions of transactions a day. That scale needs to be managed a bit, uh, and we can see a way of using RPA to, to help with that. So the, the history of government, government's use of RPA starts with revenue and customs, back in about 2015. They started trialling it in their call centre operations and their customer contact um, space, and they were the first adopters in government, and they, they jumped in pretty quickly, pretty hard, and built uh, an automation delivery centre that uh, very, very rapidly scaled up. So they built something like 50 or 60 automations in the first year and a half. Um, and they were the first adopters in government. There are 78 automations live now. They do, well, they've done about 16 million transactions processed, um, and that number's going up rapidly uh, every, every month. They were the first adopters, but behind them, no one else really did anything. So 2016, 2017, pretty much every rest of government was waiting to see what was happening, waiting to see whether this was worth doing. Um, DWP were the second followers, but that came through in 2017, quite a long way behind. Um, so we saw an opportunity in Cabinet Office to try and do something to help those other departments get up to speed. Uh, we couldn't quite understand what the gap between potential and realisation was. So we set up a centre of excellence 2017, summer 2017, uh, in partnership with a, with a private company to basically try and persuade departments of the potential. This wasn't trying to push RPA as the solution to every problem. This was just trying to make sure that everyone was considering the potential of RPA when they were looking at their business issues. So we started with well, a year of engagement, pilots, tests, building on the, the expertise of, of the vendors in the market that were already looking at uh, the opportunities across government, trying to just spread the message, talk to people uh, in, in the business to understand what they were struggling with, what they wanted to try and achieve, talking to the senior management to try and understand what their pressures were, talking to the local business areas to try and understand what tools they wanted, how they thought something like process automation might help. Um, and we did a few pilots, we built a few POCs, we worked with some of the RPA vendors to, to test out the potential of these things. Year two, so starting kind of September last year, we've moved into a quite rapid scale-up of deployment. So we've gone from, um, I think we built our first robot in September 2018. That was our first finished robot now. We have, I think, four live, and we're, we're in probably 10 or 15 in development now. We've scaled up to about eight or nine live projects across quite large swathes of governments. So we're doing lots of work with the MOD, some work with the Home Office, Department of Education, um, Department of the Environment, um, Food, Rural Affairs, and many more beyond that. Um, and we're seeing lots of momentum starting to build. So I guess the question is where we're using it in government. And I've, we've got about 100 processes, I think, across all of the government, um, central government departments. I've picked out five here, two that I'll talk about very briefly. One is the um, DWP Fit Notes. Uh, this is a, uh, a, basically a, a 
It's an automation that's been built with a combination of technologies. This is something that is probably showing the way that we will start to use RPA more in the future. This is using RPA and some off-the-shelf AI and a bit of um, code to try and basically stitch together a, a reading of a fit node. So a, a handwritten form that's sent to DWP is processed by a robot, uh, all unseen by human hands. About 50% are passed straight through. And it saved the processing time by about 33%. So it's a relatively small saving of a, of a few minutes per process. Um, but it's bit, the scale of DWP means that's, that's very worthwhile um, in the short and long term. Uh, we've also done one in, in Department for Education and the Correspondence, which is about how we uh, try and read correspondence that comes into the education environment. So we have a, we've built a robot that has about 150 something, 158 business rules that will just read through any email that comes in and tries to categorise what that email might be, understands where it's come from, and it will make a it won't make a decision. It doesn't make a decision. It's just following a, a linear path. It will allocate that to a, to whichever team is most suitable to to respond to it. It's a very um, very light touch process. It doesn't make any judgment. It just makes sure that we are actioning and dealing with the correspondence much more quickly than we used to do. And I guess the question is what we do next, because we've done quite a lot in government, but we've got 100 bots. That seems, that seems quite useful. 100 automations, thousands of bots, but 100 automations. But we're seeing adoption is still a challenge. So we don't have adoption across all of government. We've probably got four or five departments with what we would deem a relatively mature beginning, um, and probably eight or nine behind that who are, are looking at this in, in earnest. But there's still many organisations, arms length bodies, um, agencies uh, within central government that are not doing, some, doing this stuff yet. And we think there's a huge potential for all of those to, to start to catch up. For those who have begun, so your DWPs, your HMRCs, They've begun, they've got some good numbers, but the scaling is still very difficult. So DWP have built 12 automations, they're really valuable, there's lots of transactions going through, there. probably a million transactions a month by the end of this year. The volume's big, but there's only 12 processes. There's still 12 things within that huge infrastructure that need to be, that have been automated. So there's lots more potential to, to do other things. And then moving forward and touching into the kind of AI review and, and the other potential of this, we're starting to see lots of blends between very simple process automation and the more intelligent automation that you can bring with machine learning or, or optical character recognition, um, or AI, in fact. So we're seeing this as a, as a path towards the AI. It's not necessarily a precursor. Um, it's, not gonna, it's not necessarily dependent. Um, the AI isn't dependent on this work. This allows us to, to start to organize ourselves and get our, our, kind of our heads in the right space for that wider AI possibility. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, we'll go to questions from the floor in just a sec. Can I put one? Um, sort of, we've heard a lot about the, that gives us a sense of the potential of some of the applications. Can you name one of the sort of key risks around procuring or implementing uh, process automation and how we can address that risk? You just do one each. I'll start with Rania. Okay. Um, so it's not a risk, but I think it's an interesting challenge and opportunity of how we enable some of our small players, some of our new uh, businesses, small um, uh, startups, to be part of that journey. And uh, not only, not, not necessarily displace the big ones, but collaborate, in some cases display, displace, but also uh, make the supply chain, if you like, for that process a bit more colourful. Mm. And what, what, how do you address that then? Uh, we have quite, I think there is another workshop going on on procurement side, I think, for this, uh, for right this now, type. Yeah. But I think um, we, have a, we have some work to go. Um, I think uh, James may be able to say a little bit more about all the work we're doing already in the Cabinet Office with our different frameworks, etc. Uh, but openness, uh, continuous dialogue, uh, clarity and transparency on what government is trying to do will help a long way. Thank you. Um. You know, there's a saying that uh, uh, thinking outside the box, you know, and, and uh, sometimes people say that, that the saying itself has become thinking inside the box. So, uh, but I still do believe that uh, this is a very um, important principle that you have to apply to automation. Why? Because every time you start thinking about automating something, you should first think, whether you need that process at all. Maybe you need to abolish that process altogether. So it's, it, it, it's a trend uh, in many particular tax administrations that we have seen around the world that uh, you automate paper processes uh, instead of uh, trying to think whether you, know, you need that process 
at all. You know, can you can you do without it? So so before you go to process automation, you know, think maybe it's uh, process abolition that <laughs> you have to think about first. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think that dovetails is what, what I think, and I think I sort of pointed out that innovation is really a crucial risk, but uh, there's one more, and I think that, that, that warrants uh, looking at, and that's data. Uh, in order to, to, to do re real, or to automate processes really effectively, especially if they're transformative, you will need a different type of data, much more reliable data, and data that you may not ever have produced before. Before data was maybe something that you know assists in your decision making, something like a map you get from an information office that may or may not be right. It gives you some idea, but you have other ideas too, and you, you then proceed. But with automation, it's like having your car being driven by your GPS. Now, if that data isn't accurate, <laughs> well, you're going to end up in trouble. And so, this transformation of the data is vital. It's another risk. It's a key risk, but it can be tackled. It just needs uh, it needs, needs looking at in a systematic approach. Thank you. Cool. Um, I was going to say legacy processes, exactly as Dimitri said. So I'll, I'll change it a little bit. I'll wear a CFO hat and being the CFO for the Singapore government. Um, one of the biggest challenges we see, as particularly as for the back office functions, is the fact that. How, how, is how do we share what we've done? And not just at a conceptual level, but also the, the scripts and the, you know, the effort that has already been put in into developing a robot. Um, if I look at back office processes, so HR onboarding, right, a simple HR onboarding process, everybody, every government agency goes through a very similar process that says, an employee joins me, I key it into an HR system, I, I trigger an email to somebody say, provision a network account, provision a uh, user, user a staff pass, something like that. Do we really want 106, or, I've, I've, I've got about 114 government agencies, do we want all 114 of them to go out and, buy and develop an RPA robot to do that exact same process? And it's very, very low value add. Um, so how do, I, how do we then start to say, well, okay, hang on, this is low value add, it doesn't add, and especially the back office functions don't really add uh, value to the core, the core function of the individual agency, and then be able to say, well, at, at, at some level, we set up a couple of centers of excellence that will say, we develop a script for, um, a, within the center of government, and we are willing to share it with you, you then do a minor tweak, perhaps, to adjust it to your process, and that saves costs for the entire, at the whole of government level, for everybody. Thank you. So I, I think I share all of those <clears throat> concerns and, and those risks resonate with me. Um, the one that I think I've started to see a bit in government uh, here is that we think of automation as the end. So we think once we've automated it, that's the job done. And actually, I think that's the start of the job. The, the, the decision to automate is, is one thing, but you need to treat that automation as a live process. You need to be continually training it, refining it, and, and considering it as a, as a live thing, not a completed thing. And I think often we fall into the trap of, of kind of washing our hands once we've done that automation, it saves some money or it saves some time, uh, and we kind of pat ourselves on the back and we move on to the next bit. And actually, with the way the tech is developing so quickly and the way that the capability of the, of the tools is developing so quickly, we should be much more innovative and much more aggressive in the way that we start to change these things. And they should be you know, live for a few months and they should be changing almost daily. Right. Thank you. That's really good answers. Um, any questions from the floor? Any hands around? Oh, there's a lady over here, right in the middle. It's making its way to you. Can you tell us who you are? Hi, um, my name is Fiona, I'm from Department for Work and Pensions. Um, my question is um, largely directed at Dimitri, but um, do feel free to join in everyone else. Um, I was very struck 
about the level of trust that there would have to be between the citizen and the government when you are automating processes and taking them out. How do you sell that to citizens? And how would you sell it to citizens? Because Estonia is obviously quite a small country and, 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 and that makes it easier in some ways. But for somewhere like here, every time there's talk of automating a process or um, allowing government access to data, there is an instant reaction of I don't want the government anywhere near my information and I certainly don't want the government talking to my bank about anything. Uh, thank you. That's, uh, that's a very important question and uh, we have uh, a number of uh, countries around the world. We have a number of member states in the EU uh, who are largely divergent uh, in, in this aspect. Uh, it's, uh, it's a it's a legal question for some uh, countries, but more than that, it's a, it's a cultural question. So uh, without uh, going into um, uh, much detail uh, about uh, uh, how this happens, uh, you know, I'll just give you an example that although uh, we are being um, um, year on year a bit more transparent about uh, uh, tax dealings. We are uh, far away from where Nordic countries, for example, are. You know, I'll give you an example of, of uh, availability of income data. You know, in, in, in some countries it's, it's publicly available. You know, I can go and, and check on, on what my neighbor pays uh, in taxes. So uh, it, it, it's a deeply cultural issue, uh, of course. On the other hand, uh, uh, the latest trend all over the world is that, uh, and it's due to, of course, uh, abuses in the banking sector, is that uh, bank secrecy, particularly from the government, uh, you know, keeping the secret from the government, has to cease. Because, you know, uh, as a taxpayer, your, your money is not only the money that sits in your pocket, but it's also the money that is available to your government to do things uh, for people. So uh, if there are structures, if there are systems in a society that allow some people, uh, you know, allow this avoidance of, of common contribution, then it's just not fair. So if you talk about, uh, about fairness uh, in this respect, uh, then uh, uh, I think people would understand. And one more uh, thing, last thing. Um, the uh, tax administration in Estonia is usually fourth or fifth most trusted institution, government institution, way above government itself and way above uh, politicians. So uh, this trust has been earned uh, uh, over a number of years. So it takes time. Paul, do you want to... Yeah, can I just that? add... Um, uh, my colleague will speak a little bit about this afternoon, so I won't steal the sun too much, but from the Singapore experience, what we realized was citizens are generally willing to trade off some of this data privacy for convenience, right? Mm -hmm. um, all of us have got multiple websites across the whole of government, right? And if you go and apply for, I, I used to have to do this, when I file my taxes, I key in one set of information. I go get a car, I key in the same set of information, and then I go and get a house, I key in the same set of information over and over again. Um, incentivizing citizens to say, well, if you use a, what we call a MyInfo service, which is similar to a Tell Us Once type policy, both for, um, there's one for citizens, there'll be one for business coming up. The, you realize quite rapidly that citizens are prepared to give away a certain amount of privacy um, just for that convenience that says, well, I can do things and I can transact the government faster, uh, more rapidly, more easily. I don't have to keep keying in same sets of data over and over and over again. Um, and that, it's just that little incentive that says, you know, that sort of knocks them over the edge. There will still be some who say, I don't want it. I insist that I will only give you a piece of paper and that's fine. There will be some that say, well, this is how we do things. Um, secondly, the tone from the top. Um, the, um, Singapore was um, the victim of a, a cyber breach wherein the Prime Minister's health records were, were, were um, ex data exfiltrated and were extracted from the, from the health system. But the tone from the top was important, and he, he came out and publicly said, look, I knew that that was a risk, but I was prepared to do it because I knew that I wanted that service delivery. It's a digital journey. I could not, we weren't going to, I wasn't prepared to say, well, dear citizen, your health record is digital. Mine is on paper in a file somewhere. So that's uh, just a little couple of pointers that I can think of straight off the bat.
Right, yeah, very, very quickly. Um, we, we, what we heard from all colleagues today is that RPA processes, of course, are the precursor to AI. So if I wear my AI hat for a minute, one of the things that we have seen is trust being one of the key concerns of the public in various uh, domains. And you'll see every time we talk about AI, a wonderful press will put out a very, very scary robot and various other stories. But what we have done is created uh, something we call the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, which is the first in its, in its place in the world, is a body that it is independent for government, and we're hoping that not only will deal with and address some of these uh, concerns, how you make ethical automation, ethical AI, but also the important thing is the innovation in the title. When it is not a regulator and is not going to plan to stop things, it's just to address some of these important questions. So there will be more coming out from that. Thank you. Marcel? Yeah. Um, well, one, one of the, the aspects says, I think, actually is to treat the, the citizen, and especially where well, the citizen also is part of that innovation process, to treat them as a potential innovator as well. Now, that's maybe a bit harder for individual, uh, individuals, but for corporates, that's already well established. A really good, good example that I've been participating in quite a few, and some, some very in, intricate and difficult ones myself. And, the most difficult ones really went way, you know, before any consultation and so on took place. The actual constituents were actually engaged in, you know, voluntarily in, in, in shaping what should that whole picture even look like. And once that was done, there was a consensus there that then made the consultation really almost like, seem like a rubber stamping, you know, because the consultations are compulsory, but, you know, then they were basically saying, well, we designed it and it works well and we want it. Can we please have it? <laughs> and, and I think that's, that's uh, one, uh, one aspect that can be done, to so really treat the citizen as an innovator as well. Thank you. James. Just, just really, so on the process automation front, I think, Really, we're using a new tool to do something that's already being done. So, to some extent, that piece of information is being shared already, and we're just using it, we're doing it in a different way. So, it's about talking about this quite honestly, and I think having the conversation and trying to expose some of these concerns that people have about automation or about robots in an upfront way. I think often we do these things and we're a bit scared about talking about it because we're not quite sure how people will react. And that's the worst way of doing it because we tend to then get to the situation where it's automated and the response is, is not desirable, and then People are very concerned about how we got to that point. And if we can take people with us and explain how we're automating the simple stuff now and then potentially the complex stuff later, it won't solve all the problems, but it'll help us um, be honest about that up front. Thank you. Sorry, the other hands. Can I just say? Sorry. Just, just, just one small thing. Um, yeah. Small administrative matter. Um, thank you very much for the question. I have a bunch of keychains, souvenirs, so everybody, I've got a couple of them that are going around. Um, yeah, okay. The gentleman at the back will get it to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other questions? Somebody over here. Hi, I'm Colette Carroll. I work for High Speed 2. And what I'm particularly interested in is actually as we go through these processes and we learn about them and we start to make changes through using automation or indeed moving on to AI, thinking as a sort of public sector, uh, yeah, sort of as public sector bodies, how do we also take the learning about what that then made you pause and think about your business architecture, think about your capability frameworks, and how do we pull that back so that actually we start to take the learning into how we set up organizations rather than just doing process. So that's my kind of fascination in all the things you were talking about. And so my specific question is, in the experiences that you've just talked about, how have you taken that into that business architecture piece? Yes. Um, Paul, are you happy to start on this one? Good question. <laughs> no, I, 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 at some level, looking across what we do at the back office, um, we, we, starting off with things like inven uh, process inventories, and, you, and I think we'll be quite surprised when you look at your entire business and enterprise architecture that there are a lot of hidden processes that people do that are basically undocumented. Um, and, and starting off with just a simple process inventory actually opened a lot of our eyes to 
oh, we didn't know that so-and-so was doing this. Right? And, and that started to influence how we would then build the entire business architecture. Because what happened was, as we reviewed things, we said, well, is this really relevant to us? Is our business, is this the enterprise architecture that we want? Um, are these points of failure or are these inefficient processes that we find across the board? Um, again, um, with, a, with a very shared type architecture, what happens and the cloud providers have the same issue. Um, anything out of the box meets 80% of your needs straight off the bat. So what do you do for, to meet that last 20%, that last mile that you really feel is important to you? You go and build a small little satellite system that has an API call or a, a file transfer to, to get that information back and forth. Right? Um, but changing that whole argument, changing that whole architecture and that, that whole business process, you know, how, how do you re-architect it? How do I try and keep everything within the system? Whether it's automated or not doesn't really matter to me, but how do I keep it within a system? Um, I use a lot of the RPA as a stopgap to just get rid of that, to allow us to give space to review the inefficiency. And at some level, you'll find that, well, some of these processes are probably dead. Some of these processes are perhaps legacy processes. So you change your, your business. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure if that's addressing your question, but that's how we changed our business architecture for a lot of the processes that we've been doing. Thank you. Rania? Yeah, very quickly again. Um, I, I want to hear more from, from colleagues, but one of the things we always consider in at least the processes that we are dealing with, both in the department, but also uh, the project I explain, etc., is uh, where do we put the user? We always look at where the user is coming from. It is not a case of creating an RPA for the sake of RPA. So the question we ask ourselves, user first, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And it's very hard. We kind of get all caught up in the excitement and all of these things. Uh, but what we really try to keep at the back of our minds is what does the user want and what the problem is? And, and it, nine out of 10 cases, will guarantee that probably where you start is not where you end by starting the question from that end. Um, and and let, me, let me say that this is a, a very good question. Um, uh, we talk a lot about uh, user needs. We talk a lot about user focus. Uh, but uh, uh, in many instances, we understand that as if a user comes to us and tells us you know, what that need is, you know, and, and we start from there, no. The user is not able, in most cases, to tell you what, what this need is, even if this objective need is there. I mean, look at the iPhone. Did we know to want an iPhone before it was invented? No. Do we like it? Most of people do. You know, so uh, this is this is very important to be focused on on user needs, and uh, process reengineering, business process reengineering, is very important when you focus on customer instead of your own arrangements. Your business arrangements, your business organization arrangements are perfect when your processes are focused on the customer, not on your structure, not on, on your own people, not on your resources, but on, on the customer. Um, second, when you do process reengineering, in most cases, forget about uh, mapping the processes as is. Start with mapping the processes to be how you want them to be. Uh, that allows you to get rid of legacy mm. and, 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 and allows us uh, uh, creative thinking. And third thing, um, in automation, in technology, in digital success, you're only successful as long as you don't let the IT people lead. <laughs> it's the job of the business people yeah. to fully be responsible for the process, you know, whether it's on paper or whether it's IT. You can never say, you know, let the IT guy do it. No, it's your job. And you have to know what, what means are available. So um, those would be the three things that, that guarantee that, that your organization, that your business arrangements are in place. I think it's a really crucial part of, 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 of that journey, and I think it can't be started too early. Uh, really need to, you really need to look at uh, the, the business architecture right up front. And I, 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 I do agree with the saying, don't start with uh, you know, re doing like a gap analysis on your existing uh, architecture. Do, you, as you start something quite transformative, look at what the architecture could look like, <coughs> So you get an idea. No, don't 
spend huge amounts of time, but build a picture, build a vision there, and then treat the process as an, you know, as an emerging piece of work. So see you know, how you're going to phase your insight, your vision into transforming your, your actual architecture as it stands, one piece at a time, as you deliver working services. Because you will find that vision will change also. You will discover new things. And, and, and you can then phase them in because people need time to adjust. And you will then be able to eliminate, by having a vision, you'll be eliminating parts of your architecture that no longer need it. But you do it on based on evidence. Thank you. James, I think it's pretty much all been covered. The key for me is, is it not being a, a business or a digital thing. This isn't an operational tool. This isn't a business, uh, a digitally enabled thing. It is a combination of those two factors. It is going to be a digital workforce. So it's going to be considered as something which blends humans and technologies together. And so it can't be owned by just the business and enabled by digital or vice versa. It has to be a combination of those two things. And we have to be a bit more, I think, a bit more ambitious about where we look in three or four years' time. So a lot of what we talked about is the tactical, what we do over the next year or so. But I think we... We don't know what we don't know yet. We don't know what the new iPhone will be. But we know in five years' time, there'll be so much more capability. We shouldn't plan for doing what we do now a bit better. We should be thinking completely radically, like, let's fundamentally change what we deliver, not alone how we deliver it. Right. We are running five minutes late, and I don't want to eat into you guys' lunchtime. So I think perhaps we'll stop there. Um, so. Uh, we have lunch is one hour. If we can, we're back here in the plenary for 1.45 when we'll be talking about innovation in the use of data. Um, and meanwhile, can I thank all the panel for really fantastic contributions. <laughs>